Hi, it's Patrick with E38. This educational video is intended to give a basic understanding of how GNSS works for those intending to operate receivers with no prior knowledge. I'll start by defining common acronyms and terminology, explain in layman's terms how GNSS works, the expected accuracy of GNSS receivers, and how to get the most out of your equipment, as well as a real-world example that will hopefully tie it all together for your understanding. All references will be listed at the end of the video, as well as links in the description if you'd like to learn more in depth about GNSS and different factors associated with it. Let's begin. Global Navigation Satellite System, or GNSS, is a general term for a constellation of satellites that provide positioning, navigation, and timing. There are several constellations in orbit now, some for specific regions of the globe, and four major global constellations created by the US, the EU, Russia, and China. By name, those are GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, and Baidu, respectively. With signals from these satellite constellations, GNSS receivers can use a process called multilateration to determine a point on the globe. More on that later. RMS, or RMSE, is the root mean squared error, which is a quantitative measure of the accuracy. Since there's error incorporated into all of the calculations for the positioning, this is a calculation of roughly how much error there is in the final calculated coordinates that you're presented with. RTK stands for Real-Time Kinematics, kinematics being a subfield of physics and math focusing on the properties of motion in an object. PPK stands for Post-Processing Kinematics. The main difference between PPK and RTK, as you may have guessed, is when the information is processed. RTK is the preferred method, except in certain special use cases, such as when processing LiDAR data. So how do GNSS receivers work, and how accurate can we expect them to be? Again, I'm going to simplify this down quite a bit to make sense for an end user. Our GNSS receiver will use multilateration to determine its position. Using this method with a single receiver solution will give it a point with a rough accuracy of 2-3 to three meters. That accuracy is good enough for what is used in something like your cell phone's navigation. We can improve that accuracy in our GNSS receiver by bringing in a second receiver and using its solution to help correct the position of the first, or vice versa. We can establish a base by keeping one receiver stationary and maintaining a single coordinate that it will then transmit out to the other receiver. With the base transmitting its position to the second receiver, that we'll call the rover, we can accomplish far greater accuracy than before. Since both receivers are receiving signals from the same satellites and we've established a point with our base that is now added into the calculation of the position of the rover. If there are enough satellites for the calculated point for the rover to establish a fixed solution, that fixed solution will have an accuracy down to 1 to 3 centimeters in relation to the base. There is an in-between solution known as float that can appear if conditions don't allow for the calculations to be solved for fix, and the accuracy of a float solution can vary up to a meter. You may be thinking, how can my rover be accurate if my base is using a single solution for its coordinate? Let me explain a little bit about absolute and relative accuracy and how we can achieve both. In GNSS terms, absolute accuracy refers to being accurate to a point on the globe, while relative accuracy generally refers to a data set being accurate in relation to its different points. So we could be using a GNSS base and rover pair with poor absolute accuracy, yet high relative accuracy. For example, let's say our base coordinate is 2 meters from its actual coordinate on the globe but we have an RTK fix with our rover receiving corrections from our base. All of the points collected with our rover in relation to our base are centimeter accurate. So in this example, we have high relative accuracy, but poor absolute accuracy. We can achieve both easily if we were to set that base over an established monument with a known coordinate and input that coordinate for our base. If that is not an option, we can use observations recorded from our base to post-process our base coordinate using a service like Opus. Correcting our base position for a data set with high relative accuracy would then shift our data to also give it high absolute accuracy. Yet a third option would be to receive corrections from a permanent base station when establishing our base point. Now let's take a look at what GNSS looks like in practice. 
I'm going to start by finding the coordinate of my nearest NGS monument to check into. I'm going to save those coordinates as a point that I will then stake out with my GNSS receiver. I'll be using an MLID Reach RS2 Plus GNSS receiver in conjunction with MLID Flow and Flow360 in this demonstration. The corrections for my rover will be received from Ohio's state maintained continuously operating reference station network, which should give me pretty high absolute accuracy. This looks to be where I should find the monument. Let's see if it's buried here. No surprise here, I've located the survey disk that was installed in this location 34 years ago, within 3 hundredths of a foot horizontally and 5 hundredths of a foot vertically. This has been Patrick with E38 Survey Solutions, thanks for watching.